All right, guys, time to get into Secret Invasion episode two. This week's episode was called Promises. And joining me, as always, to discuss is our, our Marvel guy. It is the one and only Dan, 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 uh, it doesn't really. I haven't figured out the end of it yet. I haven't figured out how you work line them into the Marvel. The thing. day theme song would be perfect. Perfect if you want to go with that. Like that always works. I feel like uh, I'm touching a nerve here or something. Was this something that was like bringing you back it's, to the playground? Or... It's been done a million times, so I'm used to it. So yeah, I just, yeah, yeah. I, as long as someone shows a bit of originality, the Marvel theme song never been done using my name. So I greatly okay. appreciate that. Okay, there you go. I'm happy. There yeah. you go. Right, we'll, we'll have a theme song. Oh, don't worry, I'll get it all set up next week. We'll do it properly. Don't worry. I'll, I'll production get rid of it. will have like the Marvel logos flying to my face in the M. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. Uh, thanks for joining. Anyway, guys, we're going to be discussing uh, going into the spoiler verse for episode two of Secret Invasion. As usual, guys, spoiler warning we will be talking about everything you've seen, okay? Uh, up to this point. Uh, also, talking about everything in the MCU is going to be on the table. Uh, we're also going to be talking uh, probably about some comics, uh, you know, the Secret Invasion storyline uh, in the Marvel comics. But again, as with anything outside material, our goal isn't to ruin plot lines. It isn't to give anything away and spoil it. It's just to kind of give you context that may help your viewing enjoyment, to give you perspective uh, as usual. We're not going to be going in directly saying, oh, no, this person dies at the end of the comics. That's not what we're about. Um, but we, we, we may touch on it, okay? So just be warned. Uh, but if you've seen this week's episode of uh, Secret Invasion, then you should be good to go. Uh, before we get into our chat, we're going to recap it as we always do with our alternate recap for episode two which was called Promises and we start the episode going back to Brixton London in 1997 with Men in Black tearing it up in the box office Nick Fury is wishing he had one of Will Smith's neuralizers to help the Skrulls forget how he essentially made them a Team America style promise where basically if you protect Earth for the next 30 years I will never die uh, in present day Fury t plays tell me something I don't know with Talos I'll start the game um, you're not in Pulp Fiction Samuel L. Jackson you don't seem to be aware of that, the character that you're now playing uh, they argue when Talos reveals that there's a million scrolls like it's a party gone out of control like they used to say in the 90s there ain't no party like a scroll club party yes I'm saying that S sub 7 were aliens uh, Gravik meets with the scroll council which in includes the British Prime Minister NATO General Secretary and some Fox News equivalent presenter god damn it if we can't trust the Brits or Fox News who the hell can we trust uh, they named Gravik the new scroll general because he smiled whenever he was asked straightforward questions or something I didn't really understand the logic behind that, but uh, yeah, it's cool. And look, it sets up the plot. Uh, Sonia takes over an investigation of Brogan, who the Skrulls are pitching as an anti-Russian American culprit uh, for the bombings. And she goes from peep show to reservoir dogs in seconds, getting info that Gravik is working on a machine to make Skrulls stronger than before, uh, stronger before Gravik and his heavies have time to rescue Brogan and kill him off for talking. Meanwhile, after being fired by Rhodey, who was having none of this, uh, sure, I may be involved. I may have been involved in the death of. 2,000 innocent people, but we're the same skin color spiel. Uh, Fury returns home to his wife, who it's revealed is a scroll. but does Fury know? And is that the only thing she's been faking for all these years? hi -oh! And ladies and gentlemen, that was see episode two of this season of Secret Invasion at uh, Promises. Dan, uh, interesting episode, a lot happened here. Uh, Want to just get your first overall uh, takes on season two, and we're now a third of the way through the season. Uh, how's the settling down for you? It's taken its time, being totally honest. Um, look, Secret Invasion is their espionage thing. It's very deep state, very paranoia driven, which is stuff that I normally usually like. But having watched some of the Marvel movies again recently from the initial Infinity War saga and all the stuff we continuously talk about, about the controversy surrounding where they're going to go with Kang, I just, I feel that, like, where we are in the story now, I was like, where is the grand delivery? I mean, I really, like, yesterday I found myself thinking during the episode, I was like, for all the plot holes in the original Infinity Gauntlet saga, it was building to such a crescendo. We have glimpses of where it's going, but I can't help but feel now that it's getting a bit lost. Now, that sounds very melancholic. But it just is, it's a reflection I had very early on in the episode yesterday. I'm enjoying still going to the cinema, watching movies, checking the TV shows every week. But I feel like the delivery, the grand delivery is kind of getting lost. Yeah, there, there needs to be 
there, and again, it, this is what we've talked about since kind of phase four onwards. There needs to be the big picture side of Marvel needs a lot of work. They need to get us. It's it, the train is off the tracks right now, and we don't know where it is. And I agree with this. I'm more optimistic after this episode that at least. Again, I'm looking at it more on a project by project basis. Again, we we don't know because Jonathan Majors is literally in court right now. We don't know how the grand picture is gonna it, it is gonna play out. But for this project, I I feel like I agree that they're taking their time. That'd kind of be the same kind of gist of the summary I'd give after this. But I feel like it's heading towards somewhere. It feels like they've got a story to tell. But right now. I'm tell, telling a lot of the story in my own head. You know what I mean? I'm yeah, filling the blank. Same. Yep. They're, they're leaving you to kind of imagine how much of a threat the scrolls could be rather than showing you why we should be terrified of this. And I get it. But again, it's very easy to imagine why this is dangerous. But again, they're not really showing us much in that. It's just kind of we're having to fill in the blanks. We got a glimpse into Gravik, who is going to be kind of the big bad for this season. And this was, in essence, an origin story for Gravik. Um, we saw at the start of the episode that the scroll, who was later revealed as Samuel L. Jackson's wife, um, introduced Gravik to Nick Fury years back. What are your thoughts on this as a kind of origin story and this as a setup? Um, and obviously, look, he was given kind of the the, the power of uh, the, the scroll. He's named the scroll general, um, which seems to be heading towards super scroll now, uh, very much so. Um, but what are your thoughts on setting him up this week? Is he is he kind of coming across as a convincing villain or is this another case of Marvel's quote unquote much publicized villain problems? Um. I, we need to see a lot more. It feels cheap right now. Uh, it's the typical Anakin Skywalker, Obi Wan Kenobi thing. It was like I was promised loads. Uh, I want this. I'm not getting it, so I'm gonna kill all your friends. It's it's a weird thing, but it's kind of going that way. At least I guess for the Star Wars saga, you had the fact that Qui Gon Jinn made promises and Obi Wan Kenobi didn't deliver. But in this, you've just got a very what feels like cheap storytelling mechanic with like Nick Fury promising him. Literally a world, but not delivering or them believing that this delivery is not coming. Uh, I would have liked to have seen something a bit more original coming. And I do feel that sometimes some of these characters, they're not one dimensional, but their origin can kind of feel just a bit boilerplate, if that makes any sense. And I do feel that's where to go with Gravix. He's an interesting character. Um, obviously, the, from what we've seen in the trailer and then the glimpses that I'm sure we'll get into now in a sec about the files he was pulling up that they're going to be doing the more recent secret invasion angle where they're building an army of super scrolls because, like I already mentioned in the Annihilation storyline, they killed off the original super scroll who was, for all intents and purposes, a Fantastic Four villain. So the whole idea of like how was super scroll going to be super scroll before the Fantastic Four had been introduced. And we got a pretty original answer. So even though Gravix, maybe, I'm not really too happy where his character has developed from. I have to admire the ingenuity of what Marvel are doing with so many oddities. And that is obviously where they're going to go, creating the army of Super Scrolls. Okay, interesting. And I think with Gravik, again... They're leaving us to do a lot of the work. I think Kingsley Benadir is giving him a lot more gravitas than maybe the page has given him so far because he hasn't got a lot to work with. And I loved hearing Benadir give his summary of the character where he's saying that he's playing, he made the choice to play him as if he doesn't care about the big picture. He doesn't care about the promise. He doesn't care. He feels personally, there's a personal betrayal that he feels from Nick Fury dating back to when he was. And what's interesting is that it seems to be, that doesn't seem to be coming out of say the writer's rooms and the, the like the kind of interviews we're getting with the creators. Obviously uh, Kyle Bradstreet is leading the production here. That doesn't seem to be what they're going for, but that's how he's playing it and how he's perceiving it. And I think you can see a lot of that as well. He is adding a lot to it, but again, it's it's something that he has to bring to it that isn't necessarily there on the page yet. Do I feel like it could be there? Yeah, I'm intrigued. Like, I, I, I'm in, but you need to start showing me stuff because next week we're going to be halfway through the series and, and we're going to be in the back half and kind of looking for our conclusion. So we need to care 
by the end of next week and they need to actually start showing us um again the threat and why we should care about this and you've kind of touched on it there again the comics aren't necessarily spoilers because marvel has the mcu has very much gone their own way you've touched on it there but for anyone who hasn't read the comics there Again, this week we saw kind of, uh, you know, we had Scrollisi kind of following uh, Killian Scott around. Um, and, and again, you had like he, uh, they revealed, Brogan revealed, uh, while Olivia Coleman, Sonia, was uh, interrogating him that they're working on a machine um, to make Skrull stronger. Mm. What does that mean? Like, in terms of if I've never, if for people who've never read the comics, never done any research, what did the comics do here? And and what could that maybe tell us about what they may have in mind, which they're obviously going to adapt in their own way. But but what can we kind of what should be look what should we be looking out for? Yeah, so it's pretty straightforward. So the Super Scroll character Tavek, as far as I remember his name was, was a very hokey '60s villain where the squirrels had already been established as a trash. Um, a genuine threat, like like I've already made, they were more like the Chitari. That's what they felt like in the comics, whereas they felt like an immediate uh, galactic threat. The Skulls, there's a little bit more empathy with what they're going on. They're more like uh, cosmic refugees in the MCU, which you weren't extent that the comics was, it wasn't something that was reflected on too much. So Super Scroll basically, they experiment with powers of Fantastic Four, each one of them, and rolled it into a supreme genetically engineered version of scrolls in the actual secret invasion storyline the more recent one where a lot of the heroes were uh, mim- uh mirrored by the skull squirrels they basically created a small army of them but you've got the four primary character uh, powers of the fantastic four in the super scroll which is uh reed richard's ability to elongate his limbs stretch he's like Help. So beyond that, it's not just that he can stretch. His elasticity means that he's relatively invulnerable. You've got Ben Grimm's strengths. You have Johnny Storm's ability of pyrokinesis. And you've got Sue Storm's ability to create shields and make yourself visible. So what they did in this episode of the show graphics, looking at files of characters that exist in the MCU with similar traits. Um, some of them a bit odd. They're going a strange direction, but in an exciting way. The first and most obvious one is that they show Groot's tendrils, and it looks like that they were ones that were left over after the Battle of the Avengers Complex, I'm assuming, because mm. Groot hasn't spent that much time on Earth, but probably some battle damage, whatever it may be, which would explain Reed Richards' powers. You have the extremist guys, which we also saw in... When was the last time we seen them? I think we seen them in Shang-Chi. There was a guy fighting in the pit or something. Yes. So the extremist guys are still yeah. out there the rogue ones and they have the ability to combust which will mirror what johnny storm could do um you've got uh the name of the skips you call not obsidian law uh, the, the larger thanos guy yeah. uh he would be very much a thing and then you've got one of the uh what was the other one it was one of the frost beasts uh the jorge mentor guys and that doesn't have sue storm's abilities but I think with the glassiness and the kind of maybe a semi-transparency, the shield element, this is what they're going for. So they're going for a very traditional Super Squirrel who, like I said, was a fantastic four enemy, but a genuine threat. Even though he was a hokey 60s character, let's take the good guy's powers and put them all into one angry guy that's like more powerful than he should be and have them thwart him, you know, pretty much every week undermining him. But uh, as a character the comics developed and became a very in a a character with a lot of internal conflict and in the latter years of the comics became quite entertaining and this is definitely what they're going to be doing with Gravix uh, because of his how he views humanity comparing the dogs seeing you prefer his dogs stuff like that so that is the direction they're going and yeah okay maybe that is a bit spoiler we gave out the warning but we're going to be dealing with superhero level scrolls, not just shape shifting, something with a genuine, genuine trash. Um, something like, let's face it, something that has the power in the comics anyway to be a Hulk threat level. So you could imagine that these guys, once they're powered up, if it's uh, similar in any way to what they are in the comics, you're going to have something that can go toe to toe with some of the more established heavy hitters in the MCU right now. They will match their power level. Okay, interesting. And again, I don't think it's 
hugely spoiler because again like you are kind of obviously linking them and it does seem I, I really like how there's it's seeming based off that that they're almost matching the Fantastic Four's powers without having the Fantastic Four in it you know what I mean it's so, clever I, I, I yeah. respect how they've done it. it it's very smart yeah yeah Um, but again like again it, it is technically still speculation it's just it looks like very educated and it'd be weird if that wasn't true now. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, look, it is what it is, but yeah, no, great. Okay. That's something that we can kind of look forward to interesting. And then kind of who could be around if they are going to be superhero levels and we'll, we'll discuss roadie uh, in, in a bit, like, but you've got to imagine, uh, well, let's get onto it. We can discuss roadie. Okay. So roadie was in this, said that he knows about scrolls. He always has and kind of the timeline he's given is 15 years. This covers all of the Infinity Saga. So basically, as long as we've known Rhodey, he's known about Skrulls, which does feed into our theory that Rhodey is a Skrull, which is not even, like, now it's just looking like it. It's just fact at this stage. But this week, I kind of thought, you know, if he's a Skrull, is he a good Skrull? Is this one of the cases where, you know, we hear about people who've been Skrulls for so long that they forgot they were Skrulls or they've kind of adapted to become human and you know, is that where Rhodey's heart is at? I don't feel that he's necessarily a scroll working with Gravik. You know what I mean? I, I feel that he's more of an ally and would be a good guy. So again, if you're talking superheroes, Nick Fury's probably not going to get the job done by himself. Nick Fury doesn't yeah. have superpowers. He He's a guy who gets people into it. Who else could we have that could kind of match their power scale if we're talking Fantastic Four level powers, essentially? There's a lot of characters that are out there kind of in flux right now, and we don't really know where we're going. One of them had one of the best uh, a part of this saga that I really enjoyed was Shang-Chi. Now, I don't know if they're going to do anything with him, but, like, where is he? Yeah. yeah that's really – now, that is reaching. People are going to say, I don't know what this guy's talking about, but – Last time we've seen him was Doctor Strange basically picked him up for a mission, but we have no idea what's going on. And it seems like Doctor Strange now is off doing his own thing. Like, it, I'm assuming that he's going to be going a lot more head to head with uh, Dormammu. So mm. that's kind of the way that that's going. So, where's Shang-Chi? Now, Rhodey's the obvious one. And the scroll thing is interesting because there's two ways of looking at this because I've actually pulled back my theory about him being a squirrel a little right. bit. Okay. I think they could be doubling down going, we want everyone to think he's a squirrel and then they're going to pull the carpet out from us. And this other character we haven't expected is I'm starting to get a, a weird feeling about Fallsworth. I think which with her outfit choices this week, the purple and the green, I don't know that, which we've seen with all the political squirrels, they were always wearing some part of green okay. is Rody like a false flag is he so the terrorist like he's obviously a scroll and then he's mm. not and then the character we least expect there we go but if he is there's two ways of looking at it one he's always been a scroll which is there's a lot of stuff there that they're really gonna have to look at some of the stuff doesn't add up so yeah. we're talking about like Rody from when he appeared in Iron Man one always been a scroll quite unlikely has he been abducted by the scrolls and had his DNA and his personality absorbed like we seen last week in episode one. Um, that's much more a possibility. Someone pointed something like this isn't my theory. This is uh, someone else I saw when I was doing a bit more research in the episode that if Rhodey's always been a scroll, then in civil war, when he was knocked out of the sky, uh, when he was being chased by Falcon and he, his power, when he got hit the ground and he was paralyzed mm -hmm. conscious, a scroll's power would have dissipated while he was in a coma and he would have reverted back to a squirrel. Right. So now that okay, that could be just simply a plot hole. Yeah. But there's a pretty good chance if they're sticking, if they're gonna be very, very uh, stringent with their continuity, if they're gonna really stick to their guns, that's the one thing that it's gonna show that Rody's not always been a squirrel. Yeah. Could he could he be one now and could Rody be one of those isolation chambers like we saw on episode one? That's much more likely. But I have to say I'm starting to think now I, I don't know if he is. Okay. And I that's the thing I'm enjoying the most. Uh the theory crafting around who could be. Yeah. But every week I have a very strong feeling I'm gonna come back to you in episode three and say, No, you're right, Rhodey's a squirrel. Here it's why. <laughs> but th um, that's what I'm looking forward to. You that's want that. I, yeah, want that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's the engagement of the show. And I want I want them to start teasing that. Like again, I I'm kind of like worried about you know, we know that secret scrolls are a thing. And obviously if you're listening to us and even if you haven't read the comics, you know, now at home listening to this, 
that's something to look out for. But do the casual fans who don't know about the comics, do they know that? Have they given us teases? You know what I mean? Or is that just going to be, is it going to be a complete twist to them where they're like, I didn't even think that could happen? Because for me, the, everyone should get to enjoy that teasing and that they have to kind of play with that and kind of put it out there for people to actually, yeah, you have to make it a bit obvious sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Have a character question another character, you know, and, and, and kind of go that way. You mentioned Sonia there, um, and and I loved the scene again. She's she's appeared very. Olivia Coleman is appearing very briefly in episodes, but she's stealing them every single time. Like yeah. I love the scene this week. Last week her quote was, uh, "You know what I mean? Oh, you you were better. You were mediocre. Were you? Oh, that's brilliant." <laughs> um, but this week it was like, "Yes." And now that I'm here, what does that tell you about me indoors? It was brilliant. She's so charismatic. She gets her character is fantastic in this. And it, um, you see, the best thing on this show is kind of the the yeah, question, like, yeah, hundred percent. I've never seen. A more visceral, comical torture scene in any form of medium yeah. before, and yeah. she absolutely nailed it. So let I mean, let's unpack it. You cut off someone's finger; they pretty much show it, and then you inject them with a formula that boils their blood and threaten to do it again. All while you're thinking, "Oh, she's so charming." Yeah. What is that? How have they achieved this? <laughs> And, and like working against the clock, she's so cool. She knows everything that's going to happen. She knows when it's going to happen. She has it all planned out. She's one step ahead of everyone. She just has that kind of almost like, almost like Batman level IQ. You know what I mean? Where it's like, yeah. she doesn't actually have superpowers well, that we know of, but like, you, you know, she's so intelligent that you, you feel that she's one step ahead of everyone, no matter the powers that they have. Um, brilliant. Loving Olivia Coleman so far. She's nailing it. Um, the Skrull Council we met this week, and obviously now Gravik named uh, the, the, the Skrull General of it, and they're kind of moving towards a dictatorship rather than democracy there. It includes, of course, the UK Prime Minister, the NATO General Secretary. Uh, but what I got interested in and thinking about here was, and not to put you on the spot, like if there was any kind of real life people, because again, like similar, the equivalents on Earth right now who wear secret scrolls, who would they be? Like for me, for example, I was thinking Trump is an obvious one. Elon Musk, mm -hmm. 100% scroll like yeah. not even close i've already spoken about him like at the start of this, at the start of the show so i'm not going to get into another elon rant but definitely a scroll i feel like zuckerberg would be a scroll but yeah. maybe like a roadie type who's like a, a not an evil scroll you know what i mean he's like but definitely like he doesn't seem fully human you know what i mean so he, he's definitely a cyborg who's escaped from a lab who's trying to understand the human condition and failing miserably <laughs> um see scrolls are a bit more competent but i guess one and i'm, I'm going straight from home here i was like if you were to assume the role of an Irish uh, political head and you were to look at our cringy culture from an American point of view, and if you wanted to, if you, let's say you're going to be the Irish president, it has to be Michael D. It's like, <gasps> oh. it, it's like, he it was like, okay, Irish writer, like leprechauns, okay. Yeah, that'll do. Okay. So he's he's small. He looks like a leprechaun. He's charming. He's fiddly eye. It's Darby O'Gill and the little people. So, like, Gravix has, like, gotten someone to watch, you know, some Disney Irish movies, like, heavily racist shit from, like, the last 40 years ago. And they've created Michael D. Higgins as a school. Um, so that, that's where I'm going to go with that one. But uh, I, I like the Elon Musk thing because it really feels like he's trying to be human. The other yeah. one, because he's out of touch with human beings, and Jesus H. Christ, I'm going to go for Kanye West. Oh, It's the yeah. only thing that can explain how that moron thinks and why he thinks he's so good at everything he does when he's realistically dog shit. Solid secret scroll. I love it. Mm -hmm. Like, what if, like, I know, obviously, re rest in peace, bro, and obviously, Miggledy's, uh, Miggledy's late dog, but what if Road was a flirking? You know what I mean? Like, it's all there. there like, it's right in front of us this entire time. Ryan Tuberty as well is someone who definitely could be a scroll. You know what I mean? And it's I think like... he's just a gobshite. <laughs> just a regular. <laughs> I think, standard yeah, gobshite. Unfortunately, sorry to burst that bubble. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it. Actually, we're probably giving him way yeah. too much credit there. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> we learned a lot on the show this week. We learned that there's uh, one million scrolls in that uh, really interesting train scene that I'll kind of get back to uh, in, in a little bit. But that's kind of the stakes that we're dealing with. It seems that it wasn't confirmed, but it seems that during the blip, um, Palace again, the door kind of opened. They're like, hey, we lost half of humanity. So there's a lot of room here, uh, which makes a lot of sense, to be fair. I feel that Palace just made a balls of explaining this more than anything else. The, because again, if you kind of look back, it's, it's interesting. 
what I'm thinking here is like there's a lot of doors that are open, like one million scrolls who could be hiding as anyone in plain sight, and again, they're already ascending the halls of power. Um We've got four episodes left. You yeah. know, there's the machine that they're making super scrolls out of. We can't think of people. There there was kind of illusions that it could, this could end up bleeding into, like they had to show this, whatever way the running order works, they said that they had to show this before the marbles, which would, which would take in like, there's our superheroes. And that's where we kind of match the power scales. Do you yeah. see this? Like we spoke about it last week. This, this isn't getting wrapped up in the six episodes, is it? This, this is no, going, Yeah. This is it's like it's like a episode. Well, it's a, it's gonna be a movie, but this is let's do another wrestling uh, metaphor. This is the pre-show for yeah. the Marvels. That's the pay-per-view. That's yeah. what it feels like. The cosmic thing is there. We got introduced to the skulls in Captain Marvel, um, and the trailer we've seen from the Marvels hasn't really shown much other than what we know. Um, leaving Miss Marvel where we did with Kamala and Carol Danvers switching places, uh, does that open the door for Carol to make an appearance in the show as well? When you're talking about superheroes, you want to talk about raw power. Um, I think if you're to really break down in canon, the top three most powerful entities in the Marvel Cinematic Universe on the good side right now, we've got Thor, Scarlet Witch, and we have. My partner Kelly here just threw her hands up in the air in celebration. The fact that I mentioned Scarlet Witch. There you go. <laughs> so we got Thor, we got uh, Scarlet Witch, and we got uh, Captain Marvel. And from what we've seen in it, that that is obviously there's a lot of room for opinion and conjecture and everything there. But they are the ones that are set up as most powerful. Thor's busy. Scarlet Witch, we assume, is dead, and right I don't think anyone wants her to be. But yeah. for all intents and purposes, right now, yeah. So. You want to go with raw power and show off how powerful the squirrels can be. Captain Marvel is the obvious way to go. And she's on Earth now in the continuity. We know she's there. So, and they're, they've still hinted at this idea. There's something going on between Nick Fury and Captain Marvel, which hasn't been explained yet. There's some sort of fallout there that has not been explored. Mm. Uh, even like, you know, you look at the funeral scene at the end of Endgame and they were the two people who should have been shoulder to shoulder, these old comrades in arms. Um, but there was there was hints along the way to they mentioned it in one of the other movies. I can't remember what I was. I think it was uh I think it was Rambo. I think it was um Yes, it was yeah. it wasn't one division. It was one division, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. exactly what it was. That there's something going on there between Carol and Nick. Yeah. So could that lead into whatever they're doing in the Marvels? Is she going to be the Deus Ex Machina of this story? Um I mean, in the Mar- with the Marvel stuff in general, the majority of the fans do want that fan service. And it feels like with something like Secret Invasion, they're trying to make it its own thing and say, look, we can still tell a self-contained story using our mythology, which is great. And they did it very well with the last Guardians of the Galaxy movie. But you have to understand that a lot of the casual fans and then a lot of the hardcore fans do want that payoff of... Mm we just want to see one of our guys pop up we want this to have a bigger implication than it maybe deserves uh, that's what we're here for that's what we're spending our time waiting for and um, some people argue that that's hurting it but once again we've discussed these are comic book movies not movies and that's the payoff that's how the medium has always existed I, I don't mind if like Danvers is being mentioned in this this episode she was mentioned and, yeah. and she was mentioned it wasn't just thrown in you know what I mean she's a part of this story and again, I've no problem. I, I, I like this is looking very much like we're going to see Danvers in a post credit scene. You know what I mean? At the end of the series, that's that, what's going to that would be yeah. good. Yeah. Well, as much as I'd love to see her basically go toe to toe with like a super powerful like entity, but we just we haven't seen where her power limit is currently. It was yeah, explored yeah. in her movie, but the last time we saw her, she was getting headbutted by Thanos and not selling it. Mm. So she's like, there's an extreme level of power there, uh, arguably the most extreme level. Yeah. So if we were to see her take a, take an L that has serious implications. Yeah. Uh, as well. Like I, I, I'm very okay with it leading into the Marvels because you think of Rambo as well. Like she could 
answer a lot of that. What was the last time? When was the last time we saw, apart from the trailers, when was the last time we saw Monica Rambeau? We saw her with a scroll pointing up to Nick Fury's looking to speak to you. You know what I mean? So she is connected to all this. It does, the only kind of misgiving I could see and the only concern I have, and I realize that I'm now critiquing our speculation. So we've now come up with what we're convinced is going to happen. And then we're going to say, what's wrong with that? <laughs> but like, um, the only kind of thing that makes me a bit nervous about it all coming together, well, I've no problem with those characters being parachuted into this story. They're, it's relevant to them. Um, and now we know Danvers is on Earth, if it's a similar timeline, is that it, there seems to be a massive tone shift between the espionage kind of uh, Winter Soldier type vibe of this and the fun kind of vibe that they're going for with the Marvels. But again, that could be just total marketing. They could just be throwing us off and not and trying to like give us a red herring that they're not associated when actually the Marvels will end up being a much more serious film than we than maybe it looks at, at face value now because they're kind of playing with that mystery element. So it's the only thing, and and we have seen that like tone shift dramatically not work i feel recently with doctor strange the, the most recent the multiverse of madness movie where they tried to incorporate one division and it just seemed like two separate shows to the point that as i'm a scarlet witch fan as well i felt she was really betrayed in that movie and and where she ended up in one division they they totally misread that and part of that is sam raimi's admitted he didn't watch one division and that, i think that was clear um but i really i want i want if it is tied into the marvels i want the marvels to feel like this and i want the marvels to be a movie version of this that actually makes it make sense i don't want them to be two completely different projects that are, are somehow linked i think that's what the the mcu is getting wrong but again like i said that's all our speculation why could sam raimi <laughs> stop with army of darkness i mean jesus christ yeah, like, yeah. i still have flashbacks to spider-man 3 i know like, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't care what his excuses are but people say watch the movie again but sam raimi is mary jane and all the characters around are supposed to be the corporate guys he was dealing with it's a metaphor for how hollywood can like sabotage their own production i don't care yeah I don't, it was it was venom it was the black suit spider-man how did you do it so wrong yeah. and like you said like there was elements of Multiverse of Madness that are good, but that ending left a very, very bitter taste in everyone's mouth. You've got a solid fan favorite, maybe it's a contractual thing. But once again, we're in an, a, a state where the fan theories about how Wanda could survive are more entertaining than the end of the film. Yeah, yeah. That That's that's a fail, if you ask me. Yeah, very very true very true um let's talk about fury because this was a big fury episode there was a, a bit of racial discussion there which yep. i i don't know where i don't know where that's going and i don't think i think it's too early for us to kind of get into that i think you know what i mean they obviously have something in mind it would be very strange for them to have that discussion on the train around being on the color depart uh, department and then obviously that conversation with um with Rody, where he was kind of invoking the word brother to kind of, you know, uh, you know, try and build similarities there and kind of build a kinship that maybe it was the only kind of move that he had. Again, I just feel like that that's something that we need to learn more about, like, like how far they're going to go with kind of the racial undertones here. But it was interesting that they're giving us a lot. Now we obviously learned that he has a wife who's a scroll. Um, and, and obviously look, we saw her at the start of the episode. So there's obviously a history there. Uh, and, and that makes sense of the line last week where he spoke about, I know what a good looking scroll is. And like, it's like, okay, that, that now all makes sense. Um, to me, my, what, there's a couple of things here. First off, I think, I think, does he know his wife is a scroll? I, I feel the, the answer is a clear yes for me personally. Yep. Um, but I, are you pretty much of the same mind there? Yeah, I am um, talk about like a really, really bad character trait in the guy whose gimmick is he knows everything. Uh, his yeah. wife is a squirrel. I was like, oh, really? Like, come on. Yeah. Um, I do think the whole of like, people that argue what's going on with the transformation. I think that Aikens back to his opening line of like, you know, keep your, your human faces on. And um, maybe that's the little kind of secret in the relationship that she's like, I don't want to say not honoring, but. Um, maybe like then in her personal time, it's like she will revert back to her squir squirrel form. And also, there is a storytelling mechanic of we had to see for context purposes there that she is a squirrel. And how else would you do it? Like, other than like cutting her finger with a knife and seeing purple blood, but we know that doesn't work because like squirrels can disguise themselves down to their like base DNA level. Mm. 
So it was really the only way to let us know that she was a scroll. And that was a kind of big fat paycheck for that episode. That was the ooh moments. Yeah. So oh, no, I definitely I think it would be a really stupid turn to make Nick Fury not know who his wife actually is. Yeah, I I, I hundred percent agree. I it's an interesting one and like I I did think it for the first five minutes, and I'm like, yeah, of course he knows like it's Nick Fury. What the hell? Um but I think for me, what I found most interesting about Fury this episode is I heard a really great theory. I was listening to X-Ray Vision earlier in the week and I heard a great theory about Nick Fury is a scroll and here's why. I don't know if I buy it. I like the theory, um, but I don't know if I, I, I'm into that. Where I'm feeling about Nick Fury is they're kind of giving him that kind of level of fleshing out his character um, making us care about his personal life in a way we've never had to before. Yep. And obviously, look, this is his show. That makes sense that they're going to do that. But to me, you know, when we get to know characters a bit more and we're like, oh, God, this is this is what happens before they die. You know what I mean? And that's kind of where I'm at here, where I'm starting to get the feeling that if it bleeds into the Marvels, if it's something that gets Danver back, if it's something that gets Rambo back, if it's something that leads into that and this series is impactful, I'm starting to feel like this is the end for Fury because they're giving us a lot of, they're giving us Nick Fury, like this is your life. Um, and a tour through like even his childhood memories and so on. And usually you only get that level of depth and investment when they're looking for a big emotional moment at the end. And 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 they, they want us to have all that fresh in our memory so that it hits us more when it happens. Now, there's an alternative that it is the end of Nick Fury in terms of he goes off into the sunset with his wife and he retires and that's that. But I don't know, are you getting that vibe or is that just me or how does it feel now for you? A bit, yeah, no, I am getting that vibe, but I hope that's not the direction they go because one, I think then any deaths coming up in this saga, whatever it was, we thought it was the Kang one, we have no idea now. Uh, I think it could cheapen them by just killing off so many characters. It's okay to put a character into the background, have them still be their character and and hold them back when you need them. I mean, they've already done that with Nick Fury himself. Yeah. Like he's disappeared, I think, twice. And then when they need him to come back into the story for the story's sakes, he returns. Uh, I mean, th- he's an easy one to do that with as well. You know, he's king espionage. So why not have him go, right, okay, my work here is done, everything's wrapped up, big hero moments. And then you can go back because of he's on, like, he's with Saber now and stuff like that, the shield or all but done. Uh, why doesn't he just go back to the space station and then they can pull him back out when they need him in like five years time and then have a big payoff. It's like, oh, how is whatever hero they've developed for the next uh, saga gone? And then Nick Fury shows up and he saves the day. It's okay to do that stuff. They do it all the time in comics. Why do they feel like that every character they're not going to be using in the immediate future needs to be killed off? If they did that all through uh, phase one and two, um, then when we eventually got Tony Stark's death, it would have meant very, very little. Mm. So yeah. I hope they don't, but it does feel like that's the direction they're going. Uh, it could I, be a I, fake I don't out. really want to see it. It could be a fake out. I mean, it could be like, it could be the end of Guardians, Chris Pratt is, this is the end for Star-Lord and then it just wasn't. Um, So they could be just setting us up for, for a fake out at the end where we think it's the end of Fury and then he turns out it's okay. And uh, also as well, like, they haven't done anything with Saber. They've given us one look at it before and they've mentioned it a couple of times in this series. So, and the only real way to bring it back and make it relevant is Fury. Like he is the connection to Saber and obviously that is something that they want to make a part of this going forward. So again, I don't think it's it's a certainty, but it's just this episode had me feeling, oh, this is, this is interesting that they're fleshing him out that much emotionally. Any other kind of theories or anything kind of, anything else you wanted to kind of pick up from this episode? You're stewing away on. I think yeah, we've pretty much covered everything. Um, there was one plot hole that someone once again spotted. Uh, that I actually thought was very very interesting, which okay. is in Gravik's monologue about humans and their fixation towards war. But and this was very very smart. Um, I saw the guys new rock stars mentioning it briefly that humans in the Marvel Cinematic Universe aren't responsible for war, but it was actually. Uh, was it Gilgamesh who brought the concept of war to humans in the Eternals? Mm. So it's almost like humans don't have the inherent thing. So I won't say it's a plot hole, but it's interesting that he blames them so much 
for the fall of your own thing. And then Nick Fury obviously had his thing about humans not being able to coexist with each other, let alone an alien species. So I don't think we're going to see the Eternals. That's not where I'm going with this. But I just thought it was a very, very interesting statement that in this uh, version of our universe, that humans aren't fully responsible for all the horrors that we've visited upon ourselves. But it's being used as one of the mechanics for graphics to despise human. Okay, interesting. Because, like, do you know what? Uh, these and this is always the way. These these conversations week to week make me like the show more than I'm actually liking it when I watch it. <laughs> because there is a lot of balls in the air when you look at it. There's like there's a lot of things that they can tie in, and there's a lot of things they've thrown up or they've introduced, and they're like right, and they do have to pay off most, if not all of them. So. Yeah. I'm interested if they can, if they can make all that work and, and pay off all of those teams. I'm interested. I, I'm not writing this show off yet. I've still got yeah, high hopes that this show can pull it together. Um, but I think it needs to start pulling it together. Yeah. Next week's the halfway stage. So next week be an important episode, but also an important conversation for us. And we'll kind of start. There's one more thing I'll leave you with as well. That's very interesting because they're going down a very kind of civil rights issue with this. And that seems to be the underlying metaphor of the mm. entire show, which makes perfect sense this has always been the thing that the X-Men did. So when the X-Men Marvel element comes back around, it, are the X-Men going to do it again with maybe like the whole thing? Because Stanley has said that he wrote it as the, to reflect the civil rights movement in the in 66 and 68. Uh, and that has always been the thing. It, it was very well done in the, 1990, uh, the early 90s X-Men cartoon. So with them doing it in Secret Invasion, are they going to take the X-Men in a completely different different direction. That's really going down the rabbit hole. But that was in my that entered my head watching this mm. episode because this is the civil rights show. This is the and they they've touched on us a lot through the Black Panther and then some other things. But this is really leaning into it. What does that mean for when the X Men come into the MCU? Are mutants going to be seen in the way that we've seen in the comics and the cartoon, or is this going to be glanced over? Okay, interesting, interesting. Lo loads of food for thought. Uh, Dan, I, I wasn't planning on asking this, but just the week that's in it, I just got to know. Uh, best Indiana Jones movie, completely off topic. Thoughts? Last Crusade. Yeah! Um, Last Crusade. Yeah. I still, I know people are producing it now, but ever since I was, well, it came out in 89, so I would have been six. Ever since I was six, I wanted a version of The Grail Diary. <laughs> there's guys reproducing them now it's the greatest movie prop out there you gave me a gr the grail diary the original screen used one or the actual screen used delorean from back to future i'm taking the grail diary that's nice. how good last crusade is. yes yes i love it it's one of my comfort movies uh raiders of the lost ark fantastic temple of doom i'll watch it if it's on a christmas but yeah. it's always gonna be last crusade yeah, yeah, love it, love it. Great stuff. That's all I want to know. We're, we're very much in sync uh, on that as well as this show. Uh, really enjoying these conversations. I can't wait as we get uh, more into the business end of Secret Evasion. Dan Lynham, thanks for joining us this week again on Page 180. <laughs>